Well, good afternoon to everyone from here in Dubai, where we're situated with the SIPS MENA team. And welcome to everyone else from around the world, wherever you're dialing in from. This is the latest in the SIPS MENA series of webinars. And today it's all about communication, how to be a superstar communicator, be seen, be heard, make an impact. We're very lucky to have a great guest, Susan Heaton Wright, who's going to take you through the session. Uh, but just before we start, um, just remember, if, you have, if you've got any questions, please do use the Q&A um, button below. We will pick up those questions and we'll allocate plenty of time at the end of the session to answer any questions you have. Um, and please do feel free to use the chat function to chat to each other during the session or even to, to chat to us in the background. Uh, so without further ado and without keeping you holding for much longer, um, let me introduce our guest, Susan. I'll now hand over to you to take over the session. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much. It is absolutely fantastic to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
And I know from the chat that people are already intrigued about this. Be a superstar communicator. You are all amazing professionals who have a very, very specific knowledge about procurement and supply chains. And I, what I want you to do is to leave this webinar with some new tools so that you are more confident, you have more impact when you speak to other people. So before we carry on, I've got a question for you. And in this is in the poll, because we're gonna use some polls here today. I just wanna check, check to see how you're feeling today. Ready to learn, ready to go, 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 so, so or other put in the chat. So I'll just give you five more seconds to vote. Three, two, one. And if for any reason anybody isn't able to access the poll, if you want to put your answer in the chat, because I don't want you to feel excluded from the experience. So here are the results, as I'm pleased to see. Most people are ready to learn or ready to go, go, go. So let's stop sharing that. We have got the learning objectives here, which you can see very clearly. Um, obviously, you are doing professional development and it's important that we highlight those why am i talking about being a superstar communicator because i'm someone who you might know um, might already know that i'm an international speaker um, i deliver master classes internationally i used to be a prize-winning international opera singer but when I was younger, when I was at school, I was very anxious and very quiet. And it's only through the years, obviously getting older, but acquiring skills so that I could, could make an impact, even though I was a quiet person, so that I was noticed that I was visible. And this is what I want for you. And as a result of this, I developed my own superstar communicator methodology because i identified five key areas that are essential for spoken communication ironically these can be modified for written communication but we're talking about spoken communication here today and we're going to highlight all five areas for you to think about and you could incorporate when you're having all business conversations with your colleagues, with your, um, your bosses, your leaders, with your clients, with suppliers, so that you can make more impact and you can speak with clarity, with confidence and credibility. So the first one is the audience. And I want you to think about what the purpose is when you're speaking and having a conversation with other people. So it might be that you are speaking to a supplier who wants to go onto your preferred suppliers list. You know, the, the outcome for this supplier could be that it could generate more business for them. It could be that you have a colleague in another department who wants to understand how how a particular supplier that they want on the framework can be incorporated, what process has to go through it. Or it might be something as simple as a supplier who hasn't won some work, wanting some feedback. But all of these things are really, really important. The purpose of the conversation, but also who could you be speaking to? And I've got another poll here. So who could you be speaking to? You could be colleagues, your boss, customers, clients, stakeholders, prospects, business contacts, or other put in chat. And remember, if you're not able to access this, please feel free to put your answer in the chat. Once we start thinking about who our audience is, the people that we're talking to, we can start thinking about how we can 
hone what we're going to say so that it has the maximum impact. So I'll give you five more seconds to vote. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so it looks as though colleagues and your boss um, are top and stakeholders, but be aware of all of those people because it can vary, can't it? And what we say and how we say it can, can be modified. But we can have a checklist about this. We might say, oh, it's a prospect or, oh, it's a stakeholder, but we might not have met them before. And I always do a little bit of research before I speak to somebody. I will normally go on to LinkedIn and find out a little bit about them, find out what their experience is, there might be some things in common. We might have gone to the same university. Now, my first degree was in geography. The number of times I've connected with people and had a really good conversation with fellow geography graduates is amazing because we've got something in common. Or it might be that um, you've worked in similar companies or you have a shared connection. Things like that can really help because when we are, it, as human beings, we are attracted to people who have similarities to us. So if it is the same university or you worked in a similar company or you live in the same region, those are reasons for you to feel safe and you are attracted to those people. So the more we can find out about the other person, the better it is, because then we are able to to build that trust in before we have the conversation. So the, the, I've given you some examples of what you could check up on, but also part of an audience is listening to the other people. So before I did this webinar, I had a conversation with Sam and, and I discussed, I, we discussed what your organization does and what you want what sam wanted to get out of this particular webinar and i was listening i was asking questions but i was spending most of the time listening and this is something that quite often we disregard when we're thinking about i've got to say this but in fact the more we listen the better it is because we can find out a lot more about the other person. So let's move on to content. This is what you're going to say. And I'm going to whiz through some ways that you could construct your content to make the maximum amount of impact. So having a really, really clear start and a finish are so powerful. Now, if I was saying to somebody that they working with somebody on a presentation or a pitch or a contribution to a meeting, I would say that there are three ways really easy. Well, there are loads of ways that you can start a conversation or loads of ways that you can start a presentation. But there are three ways that are really easy to do. And one of them is to ask a question. Another one is a statement. And finally, another one is a statistic. So for example, if we talk about public speaking, I could say, are you frightened of public speaking? Put your hand up. A statement by might be, do you know people would rather die than do public speaking? Something I think is crazy. We live, aren't we lucky to be living? And the other one is 75% of people would rather die than do public speaking. So those three ways are very simple ways that you get the attention of your audience. Of course, there are other ways of doing that. But if you're in a meeting, for example, you could have a statement or you could be sharing a statistic, first of all, and then follow it up with the information that you want to share with other people. But likewise, 
there's the finish. So often we are in conversations or there's a presentation and at the end, people don't really know what to do. Now, I know at the end of this presentation, we have Q and A's, which is brilliant, but it, and, and this won't happen today, um, but there can be situations where there are Q and A's and then, okay, um, thank you very much. And the last thing that you have said as a speaker gets lost or that there is no clear call to action. What should the audience do? So if you're in a meeting, it's really important to include a very strong ending, what I call a call to action. What do you want people to do um, right at the end? So here are some examples. What calls to action could you use? Let's get another date in the diary. I need this information by Friday at 5 p.m. You need to send this information today. We must make a decision at this meeting. I will send over the contract at the end of this conversation or other put in chat. I'm sure you've got some other ideas, but please don't forget this part of a conversation. Really important. I can see people beginning to vote. There are quite a few different options, aren't there? And remember that you can put something into the chat if you've got another idea. Because it's great to see what you're saying. I will give you 10 more seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Okay, right. Let's have a look to see which one. Oh, that's interesting. We need to make a decision at this meeting. Really short, concise, clear. Everybody knows what the purpose of the meeting is and what outcome you want from it. Brilliant. Excellent. I hope you take that away. If that's the one thing you take away, brilliant. Um, but there are loads of other things to do as well. Also, in, in the type of industry and profession that you're in, like many other professions, there is jargon. There are particular phrases or words that you need to say for compliance. Um, and we can all get bogged down with technical words and if you're not speaking to somebody within your profession so for example if you are speaking to the marketing department who are very keen to have a, a preferred supplier on the list and you are using jargon you're going to lose that person so one of the, the really powerful things to do is to try to keep your language the vocabulary that you use very straightforward so that the other people will really understand what you're saying if they're from another discipline. And one of the ways that you can do this, and I've already said to Sam, I'm happy to come back and do a whole session on storytelling because there are a lot of myths around it. One of the ways that we can really make a difference or if we have to share some compliance or some legal requirements, you then wrap it round with a very simple story or a very simple case study to illustrate what you're saying. And neuroscientifically, what happens is that people will remember that aspect of it and so they will understand. So I've got a very, very simple storyboard here. Once upon a time, suddenly and then happily ever after. Do you know what? I have done a lot of work and research on storytelling in business, and I could have a PhD in the complicated storyboards that some people create. Keep it simple. So once upon a time, you're setting the scene. I was working with this particular um, supply chain. Suddenly, this particular thing happened because we had problems with um, with logistics. They, they weren't able to deliver 
particular products. And then what we did was that we contacted local suppliers in order to fulfill the brief there. And as a result of that, we were able to fulfill the brief for our company. You see how easy it is? And that's something that we can all, all use when we are explaining more difficult concepts or reasons behind um, some of the decisions that you have to make in procurement. So the next one is preparation. Now, I was preparing with um, the fantastic team at SIPS for this. We had various run throughs. There was a technical problem at my end earlier this week, which um, was resolved. It was a bug <laughs> in the Zoom system, um, resulting in me not being able to download. But the preparation was key. If uh, I hadn't met up with Sam and Dana and turned up today, it would have been a disaster, wouldn't it? And none of us want that to happen. We owe, I owe it to you all to deliver something that is of high value. And so the preparation, what you do before is crucial. One of the most important things, one of the, the re main reasons, well, one of the first reasons that people get nervous is they say, what am I going to say? And our minds can go blank if we haven't already prepared that. I've worked with many leaders and managers who say, the thing I really dread is on a Monday morning, I have to stand up and I have to share information with my team about the week. And I always say, have you worked out what you're going to say? No. And even if it is on a piece of paper, you write down three words or three phrases to remind you what you're going to talk about. It helps you to relax. You no longer need to worry about that because you know all of this information. It is a prompt to help you understand what you're going to say. But also, um, in the case of this webinar, I have been practicing this privately so that I really, really know my content well, so that I'm confident. How do I practice? I'm going to ask you that. So I've got another question for you here. How could we practice and prepare? So you might have to deliver a short presentation. You might have to have a very, very tricky conversation preparing and thinking about what you're going to say are going to be very, very powerful ways of doing this. So how could we prepare and practice? Will you know what you're going to say? Plan what to say. Understand what the agenda is. If you are in a meeting, if you don't have an agenda, ask, because it might be that the people that have set the meeting haven't thought about what the agenda is, and it will prompt them in the most professional way. Practice by repeating the content. Ask questions if you don't have an agenda or other. So I'll give you five more seconds. And it's always okay to ask other people for an agenda or what are we going to talk about? What objectives are? What do we want to achieve by the end of this session? So I'll give you a couple more seconds. I can see that there are still people voting. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so yeah, plan what you're going to say is the top one. But understanding what the agenda is, I can't stress that enough. It's absolutely okay to ask for it. All right. So next is the performance. Now, I'm an ex opera singer. Um, I love performing. Um, get me in the zone. I'll be there. But for many, many people, it can be it can be a challenge, can't it? And we can um, possibly let ourselves down because one amazing thing that happens is that we take note of somebody, how they present themselves when they first show up. 
So if we are looking nervous, people will pick up on that. Or if we have very closed body language, which I'll touch on um, a minute later, people will ha make a subconscious decision as to your credibility. But this information by um, Murabian, he did this in the 1970s. He recognized that when we are communicating, when we are speaking to other people, it is not exclusively what we say, but how we say it. Now, this poor man has had his, the, the, this information misquoted and misunderstood over the years. When I went to a networking event, probably 10 years ago, there was a lovely image consultant there who said that your personal communication is 93% what you wear, ah, which is completely untrue. So I went back to his original work and he quite rightly said that it is not exclusively what you say, but the tone of your voice, the way that you speak, but also your non-verbal communication, your facial expressions, your gestures, your body language. And to make the most impact, if you match what you're saying with the tone of your voice and your body language, then your audience will not get distracted. So if I were to say, I'm a leader and I'm very, very proud of what I've achieved, you might have question my leadership skills because my body language and my tone of voice didn't match what I was saying. Though I, you were distracted by the fact that my vocal tone didn't and what I and my body language didn't match those. So I want you to really, really think about if you are saying something, how you could match it with your non-verbal communication and your body language, your, your facial expressions, and also the tone of your voice. So there's somebody that did a lot of work on body language and how we present ourselves, and she's called Amy Cuddy. Now, in the additional blended learning resources, I have included a TED talk by her. She blew the world of communication alive when she came up with some specific information or, or research that she had done. She quite rightly said, your body language shapes who you are. We make a decision on other people based on how they present themselves. And these are very, very extreme body language. Not all of them are ones that I would adopt myself, but she said that the top row, those were people who had high power body language. And you will see that all of them, their heads are up, they are taking up a lot of space. Um, whereas those that had low power body language, their heads are down, like I did when I was just demonstrating, their arms and legs are crossed, they're taking up less space. Now, from a point of view of seeing someone else who, and, and credibility, I would imagine, like me, because we're all human beings, that the people on the top level, the high power people, we would feel more confident in what they were saying that those that were quite closed. So I want you to be aware if you have a tendency to look down or cross your arms and legs when you are saying something difficult or challenging to try to open up your body language so that you are, are demonstrating in a non-verbal way, your credibility. I'm sure there are gonna be questions on this. So finally, we have got the voice. Now, I believe that we should speak so it's as easy as possible for other people to listen and understand us. 
I'm aware that there are some people on this call absolutely amazing. Your native language is not English. And I salute you because you are doing business in your non-native language, which is absolutely fantastic. But what I have done is I've tried to slow down my speech and make it as clear as possible so you can listen and understand. And I've also used more general examples without using complicated language. But I want to ask you what sort of things that we need to make sure we do so that it's as easier for others to understand us. Avoid mumbling, good diction, speak at a clear speed, make the voice interesting with a variety of pauses, speak with passion or other put in chat. Because we want to make it easy. We don't want people to switch off, do we? Oh, lots of polls coming in here. I'll just give you 10 more seconds because I know we've got to go to the Q&A. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so they are. So the top one is speak at a clear speed. Particularly if we're, we're speaking with a uh, well, non-native language, and I speak as someone who studied in Italy, I would go far too fast when I was nervous. And it made it more difficult for the Italian people to understand me. So if you can slow down and I can share with you ways that you can do that, that really, really helps. We want to make the maximum impact, don't we? And so next, there is very, very interesting because there was some research done by Stirling University, Stirling University is in Scotland, and they found that subconsciously um, they, they did research on interviews and they gave assigned people junior roles and more senior roles. And they found consistently that those people that were assigned this senior role, the pitch of their voice went down slightly. And those assigned the more junior role, the pitch of their voice went up slightly. They weren't even aware that this was happening. So another thing that we should think about is how our voices change in certain situations. Are there particular conversations that you have? Maybe you're going for a pay rise or you're having to have a very difficult conversation with a supplier might be that the, the your voice, the pitch of your voice goes up slightly. So start being aware of that. What happens to your voice in different situations? Because it might be revealing things about your emotions that you might not want to reveal. So I believe that in this weird, very quick way, I've covered some of these things. And we do have some questions. But I did mention that I have my own app, which is free to download called Superstar Communicator. It's free to download on Google Play and Apple, or you can use, hopefully the QR code will work. There is a section called Slides Notes Learning. And in there, I have put Be a Superstar Communicator, and I've put some additional resources that would be of interest to you about this topic. Also, I've got my own podcast, Superstar Communicator, which is on all of the platforms, and it's all about spoken communication. And I'm very happy for people to contact me via LinkedIn and to connect with me and to continue this conversation. So I will pass over to Sam. Susan, fantastic. That's great. Thanks very much for that. 
I was going to ask you to keep your contact details up there for a little oh. bit longer. But we'll, well, it doesn't matter. We'll come back to that in a second and we'll make sure we remind people how they can contact you at the end as well. Some some real nuggets there, some interesting stuff. I was uh, I was getting a bit carried away, which is why you had a few seconds break oh. there and analysing some of your nugget, nuggets of wisdom. So thanks so much for that. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in, but I think, uh, first of all, um, I think if, if you take all of the things you've mentioned into account, what would you say is the most common mistake people make from a from a communication or public speaking uh, perspective? Is there something common that everyone does that they should stop doing now? What I found is that people will jump into the what I'm going to say without considering what the purpose is of a conversation and who you're talking to so it is a value it takes a little bit more time but really taking a step back and considering the why the purpose who who you're actually speaking to can really really help and that's that's quite interesting because uh, the question that came in from lauren um uh, what Lauren is saying is, as a kind of question and a bit of an answer is, before you go into these situations, um, maybe a presentation with an audience or your boss uh, or group presentation, is it worth spending a lot of time to clarify what the mutual expectations are? Um, I, I would agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. So, you know, we've got those situations. We'd like you to do a five minute presentation on um, and if you ask those questions, perhaps you could have a checklist. Who am I speaking to? What's the purpose of this presentation? Are we wanting to make a decision of this? Um, what outcomes might we like to have from this? Is it an education piece? Because I've been at a conference and I want to share some of the information. Um, and also, are there going to be Q&As at the end? Or um, if it's a five minute presentation, do you want me to provide a paper separately that people can read afterwards in their own time in more detail? But um, I, I would agree with Lauren that clarifying all of that really makes a difference. So it's the preparation and, and making sure there's no um, mix up in expectations, I guess. Um, great. Going back to, I think, something you mentioned before about language and, you know, Believe, believe it or not, you know, for most people in the world, um, English is not their first language. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. So and yet, as an English woman, well, as an English person, many of my fellow speakers assume that everybody speaks English really well. And that's not the case. We have to be so, so respectful and make it as easy as possible for you amazing people to understand what I'm saying. I think you're right. It's, it, I think you made a good point in avoiding colloquialisms and, um, and other things that are probably unrelatable. But uh, one of the questions that came in is, uh, how much does language actually play a role? So if, if English is, is a native language, um, it, is that the most important thing or is the content most important? Oh, that's a really good point. Um, obviously, the because English is used as a business language, that is important. But um, the vocabulary that we use might be related to the profession or the industry that you're in or, or the, uh, so for SIPs, you have particular training and the, there are particular compliance and phrases that you use. Um, but I believe we've got to make it as simple as possible and not go into too much detail because then if it's somebody who doesn't speak English as their native tongue and that they're 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 not as confident or somebody from outside the SIPs profession, you're going to lose that person. Their, their mind's going to wander because the brain, it, it, it it just gets too tired listening to this and trying to collate it and understand it. So by constructing things 
in a very simple way, using very straightforward language, using very simple case studies to illustrate what you're saying and keeping what I say, call top level brief speaking. So not going into that detail, then you're able to share that information in a way that other people will be able to digest more easily. And that's very interesting, Susan, because I think you mentioned, you know, depending on how you communicate, for example, if it's not simple enough, then your message will get lost, which as procurement professionals, that's fundamental because if your message is lost and it's not understood there and you're not articulating yourself, then there's actually no point. So um, it's, a, it's a very good point you made, which almost said this is not an option or a choice or a nice to have. If you don't adopt these um, strategies, then you will not be able to communicate, you won't be able to articulate yourself and you won't get the results uh, you require. So. Um, some very good points. Um, going back to a question, and now we had a question from Junaid, who is uh, who's asking a very interesting question and saying, at the end of the day, how do you keep calm and engage the audience? How do you do that? <laughs> well, I have warmed up beforehand, and I did touch on this earlier. Um, there are some things that, you know, be before you are speaking, we can all feel nervous, can't we? Uh, certainly I put my hand up, I always get nervous. It's something that happens to all of us, isn't it? Because it, there's the unknown element, oh, are they going to ask questions that are really difficult and I will look like a fool? Um, or will the tech go wrong? And so I have a whole system of things that I have put in place for myself. And in fact, I have another webinar on manage your fear and show up with confidence. But one of them is making sure I'm really well prepared, that I really know what I'm going to talk about, that I have practiced. But also just those few minutes beforehand, when the heartbeat is going and I've got my water next to me for, for my dry mouth, is that I take some deep breaths. And I'd be happy to share that with you all now. Um, the, way, <laughs> the way that I do it is that I breathe from my tummy and I breathe in for four. One, two, three, four. I hold the breath for five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I blow out the air for six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I will do that. Yeah, breathe. <laughs> Thank you, Pratesh. <laughs> We all know what I mean, because <laughs> um, the um, what's happening is that if you are thinking about the counting rather than that little voice, oh, it's all going to go wrong, um, you are just clearing your mind. But also from a neuroscientific point of view, if you do that four or five times, we've got a vagus nerve that goes up the spine and into our brain. And that sends the message, it's all right, it's absolutely fine. You do not need to pre um, prepare for fight or flight. You can calm down here. And that is something that certainly I found very useful. That's, uh, well, that, that's, <laughs> you weren't expecting very, that. <laughs> well, I think, I think the brief from Tommy thing has become a bit of a... Uh, uh, a breath of fresh air for people in the audience. I think there's there's more comments about that than anything else. So uh, <laughs> that, that's definitely so struck often. a nerve. So uh, often people breathe shallowly and their shoulders go up, but we've got to try and breathe from our tummies. And you know, I'm I'm. If you want me to go down this route, I will do. If you lie down on your bed, you will find that you will breathe from your tummy, so you're no longer breathing shallowly you will naturally do that. And if you start to remember those muscles that you're using so that you can access this sort of breathing, it's brilliant, it's superstar stuff. Excellent, so Prasesh, I think that, that answers your question. And yes, hopefully that will deal with the adrenaline flow. Yes, but I, I'm sure this, this is a wider subject because yeah. yeah, dealing with those nerves and you don't really have much time to deal with those nerves because they're, they're literally going to come on 
at, just before you actually have to perform, as they say. Uh, but let me go to Paul's question, and, uh, and Paul is veering away slightly from, um, you know, the the the, the kind of uh, behavioural side of it. And what he's saying is being articulate. Can, is this a skill? Can you learn to be articulate? And I'd really be interested in in your on your thoughts on this, Susan. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned right at the beginning that I was a very anxious, quiet schoolgirl, and it was only in my late twenties when I went back to my university and I saw my old tutor. We had moral tutors. At, at my university and I bumped into her at the cathedral where I was singing and she said I could not believe what you're doing you were so quiet at university so honestly if I can do it everybody can but we've got to do it poly poly for some people it isn't natural poly poly swahili take your time one step at a time <laughs> um, and you know reward yourself celebrate those successes celebrate the fact that you have done a presentation and you were articulate and you did really well um there's one thing that i have and i haven't got it with me here but i have a success journal and whenever i get some really good feedback or something went really well i record it some people do that online they have a folder on their computer so that they those times when you're feeling really nervous and oh i don't think i'm articulate enough i go back to my success journal and i read through some of those that feedback and it just reminds me that i can do it and i will do it again and i'll go to that next step poorly poorly <laughs> poorly poorly so for those non Swahili speakers that speak <laughs> amongst us that uh, I think Susan has um, clarified what she meant by that comment. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Going on to a question from uh, Khalid and, and what Khalid is saying is that uh, sometimes you, you go in to do a presentation, uh, I guess maybe the opposite of being nervous, so you, you're so excited about what you want to present, so you you speak a lot, uh, which, which probably loses your, your articulation perhaps. What can we do to avoid that situation? So, so in fact, um, being nervous and being excited are very, very close neuroscientifically, aren't they? You know, it's similar things that are going on in the brain. You've got the adrenaline. And um, so I would say doing some of those deep breathing, you know, the tummy breathing, <laughs> since we called it that now, tummy breathing before you go on, if you feel really excited to try and manage that adrenaline rush. And if you find that you're speaking too fast, see if you can take a longer breath in between when you're speaking. I didn't, I didn't explain that very well. So we breathe when, when we're in, in between clauses or sections of what we're saying. Take a little bit longer to try and slow down because then that will tell your brain that you need to slow down. That will help slow the rhythm. I hope that helps. Awesome. I think I think what will help is, uh, I don't know, do you have any more Swahili words? Because I think uh, Josh, <laughs> Josh is getting very excited about me. So, um... I lived in Kenya. I used to live in Kenya near El Duret, near the um, Rift Valley. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Joshua. Josh, Josh will be very pleased about that. Now, listen. I think um, that, that there are there are preparations and and presentations and way to ways to to avoid or or, or dress or prepare yourself for, for different situations. But I guess people are different. Uh, people are made up different. Some people are more naturally confident, uh, and and, uh, and and others aren't. So I suppose there are different ways uh, depending on your own personality to prepare because. Um, we have a question uh, from um, Raghavendra, who is basically saying, from their point of view, um, what's better? Um, preparing right up to the last minute, is that good or bad, for example? As you said, it depends on the person. Um, what I would say is that if you're leaving it to the last moment, there can be a tendency or even um, the risk of winging it 
Do you know what I mean by winging it? Yes, uh, well, I do, but it's probably worth, um, you know, gi giving it a different, uh, a, a different explanation, perhaps. So, so that's someone that hasn't really re prepared, but they they are hoping that they will get away with with talking. And um, I don't like being political, but you might be aware of our present blonde haired prime minister. He is a perfect example of someone that doesn't prepare and wings it. And it doesn't always work his way because he's put his foot in things. He, he has um, said things that he shouldn't have done. He's offended people. And I know everybody on here is a professional and that's the last thing that you would want to do. So preparation is better. Don't leave it to the last minute, because even if you are super confident uh, there, you can never prepare, prepare for all scenarios. If you prepare, if you prepare for nothing, basically, is what you're saying. Yeah, in my opinion. OK, excellent. So uh, speaking on that, on the kind of being super confident, uh, Mohammed is, is saying, well, be, does being super confident come across as rude to the audience? That's a really interesting question because being super confident could be really reassuring for an audience and you could really show your credibility. But I believe there's a fine line between super confident and what we call cocky, you know, sort of strutting on and um, being arrogant and that can, that can be quite dangerous, particularly if you are trying to influence your audience with an opinion or to make a decision that immediately everyone subconsciously is going to think, mm, I don't trust this man. So be aware of that. I think that confidence is a superpower, a super, um, superpower. I really do, because um, we it's something that can really really help us but if we tip it to arrogance then it could be destructive and i'm sure that nobody here is like that understood what about jokes <laughs> because uh yeah we have uh, christine is, is asking about jokes our jokes do they have the, a place in professional uh, presentations or communications can they help the audience feel more relief more I don't know more relaxed I guess um, or what would you say do you, do you have a view on that I do have a view on that I think first of all you really need to understand your audience because um, if you say things that could be offensive to people it could really backfire and I'm certain that there are people that are on this call that would hate to offend other people. I'm, I'm sure that we all agree on that. I think that jokes are useful because um, as we progress with um, spoken communication, um, as a human race, we're wanting more entertainment within that. What I normally do is that I put the jokes towards me or it's something very general. So if I know an audience, I know that that will be okay, or it's a joke at my expense, which is um, far less dangerous. <laughs> other people might have other opinions on that. So taking the safe route, or always, I, the I, always the advis advisable route to take, I, I would suggest. Although Stan, Stan is saying 100% jokes, uh, so I can only, I mean, maybe Stan is a, is a, is a stand-up comedian. We don't know yeah, that. Yeah, might be, yes. We, we don't really know. So, um, okay, look, um, going back to a couple of the other questions, we have Paul, who's asking a question that I don't quite understand, so I will look forward to your answer. But this question is, how do you manage imposter syndrome? Oh, so, so okay. You may have to explain imposter syndrome first and then explain how to manage it. Okay. So my feeling on imposter syndrome is that this is a situation 
where you turn up for a meeting or you are promoted to a particular level or you have to make a decision and that little voice in your ear is saying susan you can't do this you're not good enough to do that you're going to make a mistake all of those things now there's been a lot written about imposter syndrome and you know some of the things that you can do are to avoid a particular situation not speak up or over prepare do too much work all of those sorts of things my personal feeling on it it is as i've got older is that i welcome that little voice because that's showing me that I'm pushing myself outside my comfort zone. Because we can stay in our comfort zone and everything be comfortable, easy, we're not taking any risks. But if that little voice is going, that's showing me that my mind is thinking I'm taking a risk. And I always say, thank you very much. I will assess it because obviously, if it is very dangerous, I'd want to know to avoid it but in in um certainly in a professional situation i would thank my little voice and then think you know what i'm going to grab this opportunity and i'm going to step outside my comfort zone because my com so my comfort zone excuse me becomes bigger so imposter syndrome can be an ally in certain yeah, in if you, scenarios actually yeah if you reframe it Fantastic. Uh, and in the interest of a, of a couple of things we've learned from this session, first of all, uh, not telling jokes at the appropriate time, and also not offending people. I'll, I'll, I'll address one assumption straight away. So thanks, Stan. Stan is not a stand-up comedian. He's a human <laughs> profession. So <laughs> I'll acknowledge that publicly, uh, Stan. <laughs> and, and, and we won't tell any more jokes, and we won't we'll make sure we don't offend anyone. So um, look, Susan, it's been a fantastic session. We really could go on for, for a long time. On this. I know. What, what, I'll, what, what I'd be grateful if you could do, could you share your contact details again on the screen so people know how to contact you? Um, and, um, and, and also perhaps they have details of your app as well. Oh, um, yes. Now, so, shall I go back to the app? So it's called Superstar Communicator. I'm pretty certain that this QR code will work if you've got a, a phone, but if if it isn't working for whatever reason, um, you can download the Superstar Communicator app on both Google Play and on um, Apple. And what you need to do when you download it, you don't need to register. I mean, obviously, if you want to get my newsletter, fine, but you don't need to register. It's free to download. And there is a section there called Slides Notes Learning, which is on the front page. If you click that, there is a folder called Be a Superstar Communicator. And there's some more um, things that, that if you are interested um more in, more information a couple of videos a couple of podcast interviews that could be of interest to people also i've got my podcast where which superstar communicator it's a bit of a clue isn't it that everything's called the same thing um and please feel free to um connect with me if you've got any other questions please feel free to connect with me on linkedin say that you were on this webinar and I will do my best to answer the questions. Well, you've been a great guest, and uh, I think uh, we, we can't dispute your your skills in communicating, Susan. So thanks very much for that. That's useful. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some excellent questions from the audience yeah. as well. I think they've really enjoyed it, and um, and it's good to have a subject that's so intrinsic and and fundamental to to professionals in procurement and supply chain because. Uh, without those communication skills, I think we, we we fail to be as effective as we need to be. So this has been very, very useful and more importantly, very, very relevant. Uh, uh, another string to our professional bow. Um, thank you for being on the show. It's been fantastic. And thank you to the audience and uh, hope you all can keep in contact with Susan for those additional skills. Uh, thank you for attending and we'll see you at the next SIPS MENA webinar. Take care. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.